Isn't it good to know that church is a good place to bring your questions? We sometimes think that questions you deal with on your own. You come here with confidence. You pretend you don't have any questions. Well, that's not the case. I'm glad to see you in this place today. Some of you I know have, have tuned in remotely, and that's fine too. But for those of you who are physically present, I want to say good on you. There's something that happens when we are physically together to worship God. I want to thank those of you that led us in our singing this morning, the special music. Um, it is a blessing to my heart to be with you. And let me clarify, I'm not Dave Ferguson. You knew that by looking, I realize. Um, I am grateful that Pastor Dave's surgery went well on Monday. Um, you know, every time that happens, you, you take a deep breath and say, Lord, my life is in your hands, and God is good. He is recuperating well at home. I resisted the urge to call daily and check on the patient, but we did text a time or two. And uh, so I know he gives his greetings. Dave and Carolyn, I'm guessing you might be watching. We're still praying for you and know that God will continue to use you in a powerful way in this congregation. Have you been blessed by the series that he has been doing over these last several weeks? I know I have. But before we get into today's message, there is an invitation that he asked me to extend to you for Art Sabbath, April 24. Let's put that slide on the screen. You see it there? Some of you may know what an art Sabbath is. You may not. This is your opportunity to share the creative gift that God has placed in your heart. The idea being, you take a digital photograph of your piece of art, you send it to the church office, they collate these uh, and then show them at both worship services on the 24th. Now, you may be thinking, but I'm no artist. Wait. Be careful how you define artist. You all have something that God has gifted you to do well. It might be a painting, a drawing. It might be sculpture. It might be pottery. It might come from the oven. And if it's sweet rolls or cookies, I'm happy to judge those particular works of art. But the picture still needs to go to the church office. You get the idea? It can be anything that you can take a photograph of, and when you send it as an email attachment, send it to southern.edu, and in the subject line, put Art Sabbath and your name. That will help them to collect all of these pieces of art. Now, they say it'll take them a little bit of time to, to bring these things together, so you need to submit your photograph by April 11. That's just over a month. Can you do it? Yes, you can do it. I encourage you to do it. I want you to think creatively about what you might share because in doing so, we are each blessed. There is something about the giving, something about the receiving that does something to the heart. Art Sabbath, April 24. All right. As Pastor Dave has challenged us with this study of the book of Job, I think most of us were prepared to, yeah, this is an a, a important discussion of human suffering. Every one of us has experienced some sort of loss, some disappointment, so this would be a good subject for us. And yet, Pastor Dave has been saying there's a whole lot more to this book than just that. Yes, it's present. Yes, it's important. But we've also learned something about the sanctuary from the book of Job, of all things. I'd never made that connection, had you? But to recognize that, yes, through the sanctuary, we're seeing this God who wants to meet with his people. And every sacrifice Every piece of furniture, every article contained in the sanctuary is a depiction, a representation of Jesus himself. We've learned that through the sanctuary, we understand God is not a, a bloodthirsty God, but a bleeding God. 
and how Jesus himself is the sacrifice. That challenged my thinking, but helped me go a little deeper with my understanding of this book. And then was it last week, we talked about this whole life and death aspect of the book of Job. Another unique understanding that we as Seventh-day Adventists have in our understanding of Bible truth has to do with the nature of death. What happens when you die? Clearly, in the book of Job, we're reminded that death is sleep. But more importantly, death is not the end because sleep involves waking up. Would you agree? Sleep is temporary. And so the doctrine of resurrection, of new life, eternal life, embedded here in the book of Job. So today, our assignment is to find another key doctrine of, that we as Seventh-day Adventists hold dear, that being creation. How are we going to find creation in the book of Job? Well, first, uh, well... Let's agree, we need God's Spirit to guide us in this study. Pray with me. God in heaven, we come together today on this your Sabbath, in this your place, but we come as your children, your family, in need of insight, of understanding. We open our minds to new thoughts, new impressions, and know that your Holy Spirit loves to move in this setting, among us, to accomplish not our will, but yours. May it happen again today as we open your word, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before we plunge into creation and Job, the, the big picture. Job, this guy that we've never met before, we hear about him in no other place in Scripture. Job finds his life suddenly plunged into a world of hurt. What is going on? He struggles to make sense of it. Emotional devastation, financial ruin, overwhelming loss, followed then by physical pain. He is in agony. And yet, most importantly, he's perplexed by the meaning of it all and finds himself asking, God, this, this doesn't make sense. This isn't consistent with Job's world view. A worldview that was governed by a very simple premise that the righteous will prosper and the wicked will suffer. Job knew himself not to be wicked. He had done his best, his utmost, to be faithful to the God that he knew. That was Job's self-perception. But you notice, interestingly enough, in words that Job was not aware of, God himself had that perception of Job. And when that little conversation early in the book took place between God and Satan, it was God that said, by the way, have you noticed my servant, Job? Thanks a lot, God. But then he goes on, there is no one on earth like him. I'm in Job chapter 1, verse 8. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Those are God's words about Job. My goodness, if God would describe me in that way? So you can understand Job's confusion upright, godly, obedient, and yet his life has simply fallen apart. Now, he finds himself asking the inevitable question, why? What is the motivation? What is going on that he's not seeing? And his frustration seems to grow throughout the book. Now, a, a little parent comment here about the, the amount of repetition in Job. Have you noticed it? Have you read Job lately? Granted, most of the book is in Hebrew poetic form. And Hebrew poetry is built on parallelism, they call it. 
It's another word for repetition. You repeat the same idea using slightly different words. And sometimes it adds a nuance, a wrinkle. There's something a little bit else that you didn't think about, but it also gets a little repetitive. Not just one verse, but another verse, and another verse, and another chapter, and another speech. And it just goes on and on and on. But before you ask, how many different ways can you say the same thing? Let me remind you, repetition is a very important teaching tool. Have you noticed? Why else do I drill on the important stuff? I, I put it to memory. I, I make flashcards. You know, all the stuff that would help important lessons to th sink in. Repetition. It is of value, but this repetition gets crazy. Just bear in mind, when the three friends show up, they come with, with one voice, really. They're there to simply remind Job that misfortune must be understood as divine punishment. Obviously, the righteous are blessed, the wicked are punished, you're experiencing punishment, you must have done something, Job, not just admit it. Then Elihu shows up, he's the younger one who comes last, who speaks last. He's a wordy guy. His primary purpose is to demonstrate that misfortune should be understood as discipline. God's discipline, divine discipline. And let's be clear, there is an element of truth in both of those premises. Would you agree? That sometimes God uses misfortune as punishment or as discipline Certainly so that we might learn, might benefit, might make a course correction. There could be some truth in it. And that means that Job's re recurring theme is to defend his integrity. But this doesn't make sense. So now we, we, we understand there's going to be a lot of repetition, but I think we can still find important clues along the way. So... <laughs> now we're back to our assignment. Where do we find creation in the book of Job? So we start out right at the very beginning of Job's experience. Yes, the first chapter or two are that, that preamble, the, the explanation, the stuff that Job knows nothing about. All of a sudden, his life falls apart. His friends show up. They're silent for a period of time, good on them, but then they start, no, that, that's all right, that's later. After seven days of silence, Job opens his mouth. What's on his mind? It doesn't take you long to find out. It starts in Job chapter 3, verse 1. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish, and the night it was said, a boy is born, interesting contrast between birth and death right there that day may it turn to darkness can you hear Job raising his voice just a little bit may it turn to darkness may God above not care about it may no light shine upon it may darkness and deep shadow claim it once more now darkness is often used as a metaphor of difficulty is that what Job is doing or is there something more? Is this a hint of, Joseph, of Job's thinking? Because to us who have read Scripture, remember, Scripture is something Job did not have, right? He lived long before any of this was written. He had an oral tradition. There was, there was story and, and information that was passed down from generation to generation. He understood some things about God, but he didn't understand everything. Still, he makes that comment that day. May it be turned to darkness. Was he referring to kind of undoing creation? Because wasn't it God who said, let there be light? 
Now, let's not push that too far. We're reading into Job, our understanding of the creation sequence as described by Moses in Genesis chapter 1. But at least there is a question there in Job chapter 3. By the time we get to Job chapter 9, another one of Job's speeches, it becomes a whole lot clearer. Remember, we're looking for creation in the book of Job. Job chapter 9, verse 1. Then Job replied, Indeed, I know that this is true, but how can a mortal be righteous before God? Though one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. And he goes on to describe that a bit. Yes, God is the Almighty. But then notice what he says in verse 8. He alone stretches out the heavens. He treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion. Do you see where he's going? The Pleiades and the constellations of the south. Oh, there's no mistaking. Job understood there was a creator God. A creator that made everything around him and himself. Certainly, beyond the world, he was looking up at the stars. He believed that God made it all. While that is clearly expressed, there is something else that is a little more disturbing that is also expressed here in chapter 9. Notice verse 16. Even if I summoned him, and he responded, even if, there's a little bit of a doubt there, isn't it? Even if I summoned him and he responded, I do not believe he would give me a hearing. Are you reading between the lines? Do you sense what's going on with Job? He recognizes there is a divine power that created everything, but that power doesn't sound too approachable, too friendly, too understanding, at least not to Job. Is it his frustration? What's going on here? By the time we get to chapter 10, same speech, just going on a little further. I loathe my very life. That's a recurring theme, isn't it? Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint. Speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me, but tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me and spurn the work of your hands? Creation in the book of Job? Unquestionable. He saw himself to be the work of the creator. The work of your hands. While you smile on the schemes of the wicked, jump to verse 8. We're still in chapter 10. Your hands shaped me and made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Oh, He's heard the creation story much like you and I have heard the creation story. He understood a lot of what we now read in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. Hmm. But that distrust, that that questioning of this, this powerful source continues. He is concerned, and he's not so sure that God is going to show up, give him an opportunity to speak, or say anything that is going to satisfy him. Turn now to chapter 23, verse 3. Another one of Job's speeches. Boy, I went way too far. I'm in the book of Psalms. Job 23. Beginning in verse 3. Job's frustration. Though he believes... In creation, his frustration is still real. Let's start with verse 2. Even today my complaint is bitter, his hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. Verse 3, if only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I'd find out what he would answer me and consider what he had to say. If only. The inference being ain't going to happen. You can't find him. 
He's not going to give you the time of day. He's not going to answer your questions. It's not worth your time. Is that overstating it? Perhaps. We're doing our best to understand a man in a difficult situation with a little bit that's recorded about it. I think it's safe to say the theology of creation is clearly present, but the nature of the creator is an issue. And then something happens. Yeah, there are more speeches. We could go on with a lot of this that that continues to repeat itself. And then there's Elihu, and he gets started, and he goes on for a number of chapters. Remember, I, I told you, he's a wordy one. Interesting that we get to Job chapter 38, all of a sudden, everything changes. The structure of the book changes, the, the type of poetry changes, everything changes. Why? Read it with me. Then the Lord answered Job. What? Yeah, exactly. Even though Job wasn't sure that God was approachable, that he cared, that he would give him the time of day, even though Job had serious doubts, questions, and charges against God, he never expected to have a conversation with him. But here it is. Then the Lord answered Job. Out of the storm, out of a whirlwind. He may not have seen him completely, but he certainly heard a voice, and it was unmistakable who was talking to him. How do I know? Let's keep reading. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Here we go. God is going to slap him around a little bit. You can hear it coming, can't you? He's going to give him exactly what he has coming. He's going to give him information. He's going to answer his questions. It's, it's, it's going to happen. Or is it? Verse 4. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Rather than telling, God is asking. Yeah, tongue-in-cheek a bit. There's some sarcasm from time to time. But he's basically trying to draw Job in. Not to squelch his thoughts, but to stimulate them. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand, who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? These are the first of up to 30 questions that that, that God asks of Job. And these first ones start out with a common theme, don't they? It's construction language, it's architecture, it's, it's laying out the project and, and making measurements, reading plans, if you will, and then laying foundations, footings. But notice it's not just God doing his thing, but there's a response. While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Oh, it's good work. And the whole cosmos rejoices. And where were you, Job, when all that was going on? Now, we get down to verse 12, and something new is introduced. And I want to call your attention to it. Verse 12. Have you, this is God still asking a question of Job, have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Why is this significant? Because God is stepping well beyond the first cause, the power that gets everything going. He now is saying, I'm involved on a daily basis. Every morning is a gift of God as he calls the sun to life, so to speak. Hmm. 
not just getting things started, walking away, letting it run on natural law or happenstance. No, this is a God who remains engaged. That's significant, is it not? And something that you don't find in the book of Genesis. This is something new that creation continues. That goes on. Yeah, there's, there's more questions about where do you find the home of light or darkness? Can you find their places? Surely you know, verse 21, for you were already born. You've lived so many years. Maybe God's way of saying, Job, get a grip. You see this much out of this much. So you might need to moderate your perspective just a little bit. Mm. God goes on then, verse, uh, chapter 39, to begin describing unique parts of the creation that he understands, Job not so much. Verse 39, verse 1, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Every season, every cycle, God is present. That's clearly the message, isn't it? Job, you may not even know what's going on in those mountain cliffs. You don't know about those mountain goats, but I do. I'm involved. I am there. I'm, I'm a part of it. My creative power continues because I care about my creation. That's a message I'm getting. He asks questions in verses 26 and 27 about, does the hawk take flight by your wisdom? Does the eagle soar at your command, Job? Come on. These are things you don't control. You don't fully understand how all of that happens. And about that time, God begins to summarize and put the question to Job again. First, chapter 40, verse 2, the Lord says to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Seeing where this is going, Job is already experiencing a, a change of heart. Then Job answered the Lord, verse 4, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. That's an expression that's been around for a long, long time, hasn't it? Ah, I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I'll say no more. But God's not really done yet. He has something more he wants to say. This is a prolonged engagement. It's like God is, is, is relishing the opportunity to explain a little bit about the depth of his creation to Job, who had some questions. So God continues. Verse 7, brace yourself like a man. I'll question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? God is basically saying to Job, as much pain as you're in, as difficult as this circumstance is for you, you're not the one on trial. I am. The devil's made all kinds of, but he's not revealing that to Job. Job has no idea of that conversation that went on earlier in the first chapter, but that's the reality, the bigger reality, is it not? Still, Job, I think, gets the message. It's not just about him, his comfort, his family, his finances. There's a whole bigger picture here that he had no idea. Verse 9, God asks, do you have an arm like God? Can, you, can your voice thunder like his? And then he begins to, to identify a couple of other of his creative works that have raised all kinds of questions with those of us reading them and trying to understand what he's talking about. Notice verse 15. Look at the behemoth. 
oh yeah, the behemoth. I saw him at the zoo. You did? What were we looking at? Oh, it's described and we try and figure out what is this behemoth? It, it eats vegetables. It's got massive legs. It's not afraid of the water. Uh, is it an elephant? No, his tail is not as big as it's described here. Oh, maybe it's a hippopotamus. Yeah, whatever. We don't know, but God was pretty proud of the behemoth. And when it is several verses talking about how cool the behemoth was, notice what he said, though, in the last part of verse 15. Look at the behemoth, which I made along with you. I made the behemoth, and I made you. And I care just as much for the one as I do the other. I'm just as engaged, just as involved with one as the other. Job, are you listening? Ah, chapter 41. Next species that God brings up on the video screen. Can you pull in the Leviathan with a fishhook? Oh, the mighty Leviathan. And what do you suppose that was? Oh, you, you read it through. Obviously, you can't tie down his tongue with a rope or put a cord through his nose, or pierce his jaw with a hook. He goes on to say, you can't lead him around on a leash like a pet. This is some magnificent creature. Powerful, scary, armored. Leaves a trail behind him as he goes through the mud. And some people have said, "Mm, maybe it's a crocodile. There is much that we don't know, but some things begin to come through clearly. And then notice the question that God asks in verse 10. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. Job, it's all mine. I created it, I sustain it, I care for it, and I care for you. Don't put me on trial, Job. I'm here. I'm talking to you. Now, Job doesn't have any context for this, but you and I know this interaction between God Almighty and Job which takes up four chapters in our Bibles, is the longest such interaction between God and any human being in all of Scripture. This is an important conversation that God is trying to have. Yeah, there's some code words. There's some stuff that's not easy to to decipher, but it's coming through. And to me, loud and clear, God is more than a first cause. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. What he... uh, can take care of, nobody can fathom or control. God is it. But he's a whole lot more than that. He's compassionate. He's approachable. He's engaging. He's involved. He cares. And about that time, Job has had enough. Even without what would appear to be a a logical summary statement, a conclusion, where God would say, now do you get it, Job? There's none of that. It's as though Job kind of interrupts and just says, chapter 42, verse 2, I know now, Lord, that you can do all things. Yes, there's all power there. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely, Job admits, I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I'll speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. Verse 5. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. You see, it's, it's dramatically different to believe in creation than it is to meet the Creator. 
What changes is the personal, relational dynamic that comes when you hear his voice and sense his care, his involvement, his engagement. And all of a sudden, Job says, it's different now. I see what I didn't see before. Now I see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Notice, God didn't answer the big questions, did he? He didn't resolve all of Job's doubts. He didn't explain what was going on, the great controversy thing. He, he, he didn't take away the circumstance in which Job found himself. There's still agony, heartbreak, pain. What Job did understand is that he had a creator who was responsive engaging, cared. And all of a sudden, a change of heart, repentance took place. We worship God, not just because he's the most powerful being on the planet. We worship God, not just because he holds all the cards, not just because he twists us on a string and says, jump, jump a little higher, jump, jump, jump. We worship God because we recognize he is the loving creator. We are his creatures. How do I know that? Let me remind you of Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. And this concept is repeated throughout Scripture. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for... Why? Because you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We worship him because he is our creator God, our loving creator God. Does that remind you of the words of the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. We worship him because he is worthy of our worship. Might I suggest that for you and me, struggling with our own stuff, our own issues, things that crowd in on our lives, make us wonder if we're going crazy. It might be physical pain, it might be relational pain, emotional pain, stress, you name it. We all have something we're struggling with. But somehow, meeting the Creator God changes that. Oh, it doesn't take it away necessarily, it doesn't remove the pain, but it puts it in a different context, a context of which God is saying, I'm bigger than all this. I've got this, and I've got you. Trust me. That's really what I sense is coming through with Job. Questions? Yes, still some questions. Pain, still pain, but trust, the trust has been restored, maybe has grown, maybe was absent. There is trust that changes everything. And so, for you and me, dealing with our own stuff, if we want to reframe our current experience, we simply need to meet the Creator. And I can't think of any better time to meet the Creator than spring in Tennessee. Do you have plans this afternoon? Get outside. Go outside with a specific purpose to look for the hand of the Creator. You might just wander around the campus, go into your backyard, take a magnifying glass. The closer you look, the more complexity you see. You'll be amazed at the world around you. Meet the Creator. And when we see the Creator, our lives are somehow put into better alignment. They're adjusted in a way that allows us to go forward with confidence, not fear, 
confidence because our trust is restored. He who can take care of all of this, not just get it going and walk away, get it going, sustain it through all of these years, tells us that he can also sustain you and me through all of our issues. Granted, we live in a sinful world. Trouble will come. But there's hope. That concept is summarized in the scripture reading that was read. Do you remember it? Jeremiah chapter 43, excuse me, Isaiah, different prophet, Isaiah chapter 43, starting in verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says, he who created you, O Jacob, there's that word, God saying, I created you. And Jacob, meaning his people, could that apply to us? Yes, of course. He who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel. This is the creator God speaking. And what is he going to say? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Approachable, relational, caring, compassionate, all-powerful, all-knowing. Yes, that's our creator God. He then goes on. When you pass through the waters, notice not if, on the off chance that something bad's going to happen in your life, no, he knows that we live in a sin-fractured planet. Satan is hard at work to distract, discourage, depress. Here, our Creator God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Isn't that good news? When you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. He's got this. And we, along with Job, can say this morning... Creator God, I've known about you for a long, long time. But today, I renew my trust in you, in your heart, your plan for my life and my destiny. Pray with me. God in heaven, how much we need this message today. We face a lot of stuff. And every one of us faces our own stuff stuff that we don't fully understand. We have questions, we have doubts, we struggle to make sense of it all. We ask why a lot of the time. Granted, we might like answers, but I'm not sure they would satisfy. Instead, open our eyes to see you, to allow us to experience you as the all-powerful all-loving creator God who is present, who surprises us by showing up when we least expect it, by reaching out and reminding us whatever we face, you will be with us. Today, we trust you anew. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great Sabbath. Remember, you have an assignment. What is it? Get outdoors. Look for the creator. Your life will be changed. Stay right where you are. You'll be dismissed by Rose. God bless you and happy Sabbath.